Welcome back to Coriam, the official podcast of the NYU Bellevue Emergency Medicine Residency Program. I'm Brian Gaberti, and today we're joined by Dr. Jonathan Kobols. Dr. Kobols is a clinical instructor of emergency medicine, trained at UCSF, completed his medical education fellowship at Yale, and is co-editor-in-chief of Coriam. Great to have you in the studio, Jonathan. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. So I'm glad that you're here to help us dissect a topic that doesn't get much more essential than hyperkalemia. And it's a label that we put on a process that can range from being mild to life-threatening. And across that range, there could be no change in symptoms in our patients until it's too late. So can you kick us off with some background information on hyperkalemia? How is it defined and in which patients should we suspect it? Hyperkalemia is one of the electrolyte disorders that I think we see and manage on every single shift. It's going to be defined as a potassium level greater than 5.5 milliequivalents per liter, although this may vary slightly based on the specific assays used at your shop. Patients for which you should always be on the lookout for hyperkalemia include those with CKD and ESRD, as well as some other high-risk populations, including those with extensive cardiac histories, transplant patients, oncology patients, diabetics, or those with a history or risk factors for adrenal insufficiency, just to name a few. I have a low threshold to obtain an EKG in addition to blood tests when these patients come through the door. Okay, we have a better understanding of the population. Now we get our labs back and the value is over 5.5 for potassium. And we have to think about why that is. The most common reason why a patient's going to have labs with an elevated potassium is going to be pseudohyperkalemia, such as a hemolyzed sample. And we're used to seeing this in patients who are difficult sticks or with prolonged tourniquet times. For these patients, those with a hemolyzed sample, Jonathan, tell us about what you're considering when you decide to repeat the chemistry and when you decide not to. I think that's a fair question. Not a shift goes by where I don't see a hemolyzed potassium sample. By and large, if an electrolyte disorder such as hyperkalemia is on my differential, either due to the symptoms that the patient is presenting with or a concerning EKG finding, or if the patient is one of those previously listed high-risk categories, I'm definitely getting a repeat potassium. I do think there exists a small population of relatively young and healthy patients without significant comorbidities or who are not taking hyperkalemic-inducing medications that are found to have a spuriously hemolyzed potassium sample. In these patients, it may be reasonable to defer repeat potassium as long as the remainder of the BMP, including the creatinine, are unremarkable. In fact, a 2023 study demonstrated that in a sample size of 145 children with hemolyzed hyperkalemia, only three children had true hyperkalemia. And all three patients were sick to begin with, including one patient having known chronic renal failure and the other two patients presenting in DKA. It's also worth mentioning that if a patient has a normal potassium on another test, such as a concomitant VBG, I will often defer repeating a hemolyzed sample. Okay, so in a patient with a clearly hemolyzed sample with normal kidney function, who's not on medications without acidosis, we can consider not sticking them again. As we move on to other causes of hyperkalemia, it can be useful to split it up into two categories an increase in total body potassium, and a redistribution of potassium. For those with an increased total body potassium, it goes without saying that we're going to be thinking about our patients with renal dysfunction. But it's also important to keep our differential broad, so consider Addison's, type 4 RTA, and also drug-induced hyperkalemia, such as patients who are taking spironolactone or ACE inhibitors or NSAIDs, just to name a couple. For patients in the redistribution category, we have our acidemic patients and those with cellular breakdown, so those with rhabdomyolysis or tumor lysis syndrome. The list is certainly extensive here, and it's going to be in our show notes for those who want to take a deeper dive. Now, talk to us about symptoms, Jonathan. First and foremost, the old saying that the first symptom of hyperkalemia is death is one that every provider should respect. For patients who do eventually develop symptoms related to their hyperkalemia, You might see cardiovascular symptoms such as palpitations, arrhythmia, or syncope, neurologic symptoms including nonspecific muscle weakness and paresthesias, or even vague GI symptoms including nausea and vomiting. Often in my practice, I find that an abnormal EKG is the first clue to a disorder causing hyperkalemia. So with that said, why don't we dissect the relationship between hyperkalemia and the EKG? Of course, and this may be the first red flag that an emergency room doctor is going to get with a patient who is hyperkalemic. Now, certainly a nuanced part of the topic that deserves some time here. The typical progression that is taught is peak T's, shortened QT, then PR and QRS lengthening, then the sine wave pattern. But this isn't the whole picture here. It's important to note that ECGs are poorly sensitive for hyperkalemia, so a person can have a totally normal ECG with an elevated potassium, But on the other side of that, it's also on the case report level that somebody has a potassium over 9 and has a normal ECG. I should also say that not all changes are going to be equally concerning if we see them. In one study, those associated with an increased risk of VTAC, VFib, 
code and death were QRS widening, junctional rhythm, and bradycardia in that order. Okay, Jonathan, I know you have more on this topic. Why don't you run us out with some additional ECG pearls? I like that you bring up the nonlinear association between potassium levels and EKG changes, as this concept often differs from the way that traditional hyperkalemic EKG changes are taught. It is worth reiterating that there are multiple variables that can affect the degree of EKG changes you are seeing at a certain potassium level, as well as the symptoms that a patient is presenting with. For example, patients with underlying interventricular conduction delays may hide their hyperkalemic EKG changes. For them, the first changes on the EKG may be widening of the QRS interval. An attending taught me to be suspicious of the patient presenting with a left bundle branch block greater than 160 milliseconds or a right bundle branch block greater than 140 milliseconds, especially if these are changes from the patient's baseline EKG. Further, one should always be on the lookout for synergism between hyperkalemia, renal injury, and AV nodal blocking agents that a patient may be taking, for these combined may result in a profound bradycardia, including cardiogenic shock, that seems significantly out of proportion to the potassium levels that you are seeing on the BMP. This syndrome is becoming increasingly recognized in the critical care world and has been labeled as BRASH syndrome, standing for bradycardia, renal failure, AV nodal blocker, shock, and hyperkalemia. So keep our antennas up for BRASH syndrome. And ECG is such a complex component of the evaluation for these patients, but it's just one part of it. So walk us through the rest of the evaluation. I know you're getting chemistry, but tell us about the other tests that you're getting in these patients. Ultimately, I am working the patient up for the symptoms that brought them to the emergency department in the first place. For patients on dialysis, I am getting a BBG while assessing for other indications of emergent dialysis. Patients with a new or unexplained AKI, I am working them up for the etiology of their AKI. Some unique patient populations might include those with a history suggestive of rhabdo, in which case I am also sending a CPK. Patients dependent on chronic steroids or those with multiple electrolyte abnormalities, such as hyponatremia and metabolic acidosis, I may expand the workup and include etiology such as adrenal insufficiency. And while this isn't a test per se, it is worth a reminder to do a very thorough med rec on patients with new or unexplained hyperkalemia. But moving beyond the workup, Ryan, how do you approach the management of hyperkalemia? Jonathan, I really like this point that we should be asking ourselves not just how bad the hyperkalemia is, but why are they hyperkalemic? And one of the big questions here is when do we treat before we have the last pack? And there isn't going to be a blanket recommendation that I can make here. I will say that a patient who has concerning ECG findings who missed hemodialysis, I'm going to start treating them right off the bat while we wait for our labs to come back. Now, with that being said, this is another part where it's useful to think of the approaches in categories, cardiac protection, potassium shifting, and potassium removal. Jonathan, start us off with cardiac protection. What are we giving, how much, and over how much time? And let us know if there are any additional considerations for these agents. The cornerstone of cardio protection or stabilization of the myocardium is IV calcium. Calcium comes in two forms in the ED, gluconate and chloride. Calcium gluconate is often the form we reach for when the patient is hemodynamically stable. It can be given in doses of 1 to 2 grams and should be administered over a 5 to 10 minute period to prevent side effects including hypotension or arrhythmia. And while calcium chloride has three times the potency of gluconate, it should be reserved for patients in extremis, including those with persistent arrhythmia or signs of bradycardic shock. This is due to calcium chloride's propensity to be damaging to small veins. Ideally, calcium chloride should be given through a central venous catheter. Okay, good. So that's cardiac stabilization. Now let's start talking about shifting. Here, our go-tos are going to be insulin and albuterol, and insulin can be given in either 5 units or 10 units, but 5 units, as expected, is going to give us less hypoglycemic episodes. The onset's going to be about 10 to 20 minutes after giving it, and the effect lasts for 4 to 6 hours. Albuterol is our next agent, and this is not going to be at our asthma dose. This is going to be a much higher dose at 10 to 20 milligrams over 10 minutes. So that's 4 to 8 times the asthma dose. Its peak effect is going to be a bit longer than insulin at 90 minutes, and these agents are going to decrease the potassium by about 0.6 to 1.2 milliequivalents per liter, buying us some time. Now, I can't finish talking about shifting without talking about sodium bicarb, and it's complicated. The long and short is that it's not useful in hyperkalemic non-acidotic patients. Amps of bicarb are not going to be effective to accomplish what we want to do, and the drip's going to take hours to work, and we have to consider volume in our anuric patients. If there is a role for bicarb, then it may be in the volume-depleted patient who is oliguric with hyperkalemia. Okay, now time for the meat and potatoes of treatment, removal. Jonathan talks about what's in our toolbox for this category. Ultimately, Removing potassium is going to fall into one of three treatment strategies. The most commonly utilized is diuretics, with the goal of inducing calyuresis, 
or potassium excretion in the urine. First off, you should have an idea of the volume status in these patients, as it will change the management. In the non-dialysis-dependent patient presenting to the ED with hyperkalemia and signs of hypervolemia, perhaps associated with AKI, it is a perfectly reasonable strategy to start a diuretic such as 40 mg of IV Lasix. In the setting of AKI or CKD, you may have to start at a higher diuretic dose to achieve similar results. Euvolemic patients may respond to a diuretic paired with an IV crystalloid bolus. And for hypovolemic patients or those in whom you suspect premenal AKI, fluids alone may facilitate appropriate calyresis by improving renal blood flow and treating the prerenal AKI. Okay, now that we're talking about fluids, I think it's a good point to talk about which type of fluids are preferred in these patients and if lactated ringers is safe. So help us understand the basis or lack thereof of this concern. I'm glad you brought this up. Historically, people have avoided giving LR to these patients as LR contains small amounts of potassium, but studies have routinely demonstrated that this risk does not play out clinically and patients receiving LR are less likely to experience clinical hyperkalemia than those receiving NS due to the avoidance of a hyperkalemic metabolic acidosis that can be caused by large amounts of normal saline. The next strategy for potassium removal is through the GI tract with a medication called Lokelma. Lokelma is a resin that binds potassium in the GI tract. Unlike older potassium binders such as KXLate, Lokelma demonstrates improved safety and is not associated with bowel necrosis. Typically, Lokelma can start working in 1-2 to two hours of administration, and one can expect approximately 0.4 milliequivalents per liter reduction in potassium levels at 4 hours, following a 10 gram dose that can be given every 8 hours. But do note, this is not a magic bullet in patients who ultimately need dialysis. And this leads me to our last method of potassium removal, good old dialysis. This is the ultimate intervention in those who do not produce urine or are refractory to targeted medical therapies. Involve renal early for patients who are already known to be dialysis dependent, even before the workup is complete. And while dialysis may be easy to facilitate in those who are already dialysis dependent, newly anuric patients may require the placement of a dialysis catheter in the emergency department. Okay, Jonathan, so those are patients who are hyperkalemic and require dialysis. And practicing in New York City, you know this, it may be easy to take access to dialysis for granted. But what about those patients who are severely hyperkalemic or who don't have immediate access to dialysis? When your back is against the wall, there are a few things you might consider, but be aware that none of them have really been proven to change outcomes in hyperkalemia, especially in patients who ultimately require dialysis. One strategy might include sequential blockade of the nephron, which often involves the use of loop diuretics, and in these cases, I'm talking high doses, 160 to 250 milligrams of IV Lasix or 4 to 5 milligrams of IV Mumex. Loop diuretics are then paired with thiazide diuretics such as chlorothalazide or metolazone and sometimes acetazolamide. Ultimately, the goal is to achieve an effective caloresis in patients who have limited renal reserve. One other patient population to be aware of are those in extremis with signs of bradycardia and cardiogenic shock. While there are likely more specific interventions that may need to be implemented depending on the scenario, I find that for these patients, especially those with there's a concern for BRAS syndrome, an epinephrine drip can facilitate increased chronotropy and contractility to improve cardiac output and renal perfusion, with the added benefit of being a strong driver of shifting potassium back into the cells. Okay, deep breath, big topic. Let's go over some take-home points. Hyperkalemia can be difficult to pick up before labs come back because it can lurk without symptoms or even ECG findings. If a patient does have ECG findings, they may not follow that linear pattern that is traditionally taught, and ECGs can be poorly sensitive. Now, if you do see these changes, the ones that are more commonly associated with adverse events are QRS widening, junctional rhythm, and bradycardia. Treatment is a numbers game. Calcium for cardiac stabilization can last 30 to 60 minutes. Insulin will be the fastest way to ship potassium back into the cells, but be mindful that 10 units is associated with increased episodes of hypoglycemia, whereas 5 units may have the same effect in reducing potassium. And albuterol is at a much higher dose than what we give for asthma. Lokelma is now a pillar of treatment for the removal of potassium, and diuretics with the goal of chiuresis may have a role in the oliguric patient, and increased doses along with other agents may buy us some time in the severely hyperkalemic patient when HD is not readily available. Okay, that's it for this episode. Jonathan, thanks again for being in the studio to tackle this essential topic. Let's do it again soon. Mm-hmm.